and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the adventure system, and the and the man behind, and the man of a thousand beers, the one and only Philip T. Don't call him Grizzly Adams. How you doing today, man? I'm good, Mildred. How are you? Appreciate you having me on. <laughs> Thank thanks for thanks for coming on and enjoy and enjoying the insanity. Um, especially especially since we don't have the kind of technical difficulties we had um, when we tried to do this previously. Which was absolutely embarrassing. I like to think of myself as a technical person, and you know, you expect your headset to work, and uh, you know, and I use it a lot for gaming sessions, but it uh, failed me. So here we are, however, using the backup plan this time. So all is well. Mm -hmm. And when, now, um, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. So with that in mind. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Boy, ultimately, I think, um, you know, my friends and I long ago, and I, I was young at that point, you know, the first game we played was uh, the Dungeons & Dragons boxed set. Not the white one, but the basic edition, the first one that came out after that. And um, I couldn't even tell you how old I was at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we were all just creative people. None of us were really athletes, so nerds, I suppose, or geeks, if you prefer. And um, we had been playing um, this tile game, the Wizard's Tower or something like that. I can't even remember what the heck the name of it was. And one of my friends, uh, Matt, this guy who lives in Arizona, uh, picked up a copy of D&D, &D, and we were all just immediately drawn to it and started uh you know logging a lot of hours at that point and this was long ago well before video games so you know if you were creative type of person who wanted to exercise your imagination and you weren't into the theater or something like that it, it was really a eye-opening outlet for us at that point mm -hmm. and taking that taking that into account what was what was the spark when it came to cr creating the adventure system? Well, that's a long story that I'll try and keep reasonably short that started back, um, you know, when I was much younger, as I just described. We've been playing D&D &D for a while, mm -hmm. and Top Secret came out by TSR. It was a spy game. Many people may have not heard of it. And it, used, and it used percentile dice mm -hmm. um, for your resolution. Yeah. And apparently that awakened my inner game designer, if there's such a thing. And I was immediately very intrigued by it. And we took a quick break from D&D &D and played Top Secret for a little while. But as I think most people would probably agree, uh, for some reason, fantasy really speaks to everybody it's probably the most popular of the genres played out there from an rpg perspective mm -hmm. and um so we're ready to return to fantasy but again that inner game designer of mine came to the surface and um i redesigned my fantasy world using essentially the top secret percentile system and over many 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 years i just continued to use my own system i'd run other games at various different times but I always returned to running a game of my own design. It had changed from percentiles to 2D10 to introduce uh, more of a curve, not quite the same as 3D6, but still a pretty decent curve. And ultimately then to polyhedral dice, uh, which is what the adventure system uses now to represent skills and statistics. And over that time, really what sort of crystallized for me was everything being as simple as possible without all tactical elements being removed from the game. So simple, yet it was tactical enough to still be engaging. And one of the core pieces of that 
was using dice mechanics instead of modifiers. Mm -hmm. And that's where um, the adventure system landed as it stands now, polyhedral system to represent statistics and skills, and all conflict is resolved using dice mechanics. There aren't any modifiers. And all of that was fed by my desire to just have something that was as simple as possible. And ultimately, you know, polyhedral do dice are just cool. So it's fun to use them for your principal mechanic. Yeah. Um, now, obvious, obviously, given that the adventure system uses a polyhedral setup, I'm sure that when tr when trying to pitch it a few times, you ended up getting some Savage Worlds comparisons. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt that that's absolutely true in that the Adventure System and Savage Worlds are the same in the same way that two games that use D6 dice pools or use a D20 as their resolution mechanic are the same. There are going to be similarities and there are going to be places where they diverge. Yeah. Primarily, um, in this case, what I already mentioned is all dice mechanics and no modifiers is the first and probably most important spot. Then there's also what I like to think is a fairly unique fate and destiny system mm -hmm. that's used for all of your advancement and changing uh, roles in play. And then a compass system, what I refer to as the compass system, which mm -hmm. uh, is that tracks your morality, sanity, and honor mm -hmm. based upon your character's actions in the game. And the last piece of it is the powers. Um, Savage Worlds, uh, which I am familiar with, not the most recent edition, but the previous one, mm -hmm. um, their powers are all generic. And then when you create your character, your mage, your cleric, your scion, whatever, you sort of relabel them and pick and choose as you see fit. Um, ultimately, I wanted to go in a different direction in the adventure system with powers. They are much more, I like to think, uh, four color and flavorful in that you've got a elemental magic, sorcery, divine magic, uh, mentalism, for psionics and whatnot and each one of those for example within sorcery you have necromancy thaumaturgy conjuration and enchantment and i tried as much as i could to make each one of those things feel like what it was supposed to represent necromancy would obviously be one of the easier ones to make it feel like necromancy you know dark evil magic having to do with death or undeath mm -hmm. so really the adventure system and savage worlds diverge from the point you get to after you say, you know, your skills and statistics are represented by polyhedral dice. Yeah. Now, when it comes, when it comes to that whole concept of, poly of polyhedral, one of the things that I did notice, um, compared, especially compared to savage worlds is it looks like for the most part, Barring advantage and disadvantage, um, you're not going to be rolling many die. Per period. You'll be rolling a sink. You'll be rolling a single polyhedral, but you're not. But it's not going to be a case where you have an attribute die and a skill die. Correct. And um, interestingly, the uh, core players that have, you know, friends of mine who've mm -hmm. played in my game system over time, were surprised I didn't go in that direction. Because uh, previous versions, the 2D10 version, for example, your statistic and skill mm -hmm. comprised your roles. But as I really wanted to make things as simple as possible, I made a conscious decision that, hey, if your strength's a D8 and you're making a strength check, it's a D8. If you're using your fight skill, even though it's based on strength, you're purely using your fight die now your strength and statistics come into play in other elements of the game but i really wanted when focusing on dice mechanics to keep it as simple as possible um, keep as much math out of it as possible which is unavoidable right so damage happens to be two dice so we can talk about that mm -hmm. if you want so you do have to add stuff together and your dice can max which is um ultimately 
in a polyhedral type of system, to my mind, really mandatory without having your dice able to match. You know, if you've got a D4 skill, you can't possibly hit a higher number. So there is some adding of dice together. Mm-hmm. But I really wanted to keep it as straightforward as possible, which is why I went with the um, single die. And particularly with advantage and disadvantage, because then, you know, if you've, say, you've got a D8 strength and your fight's a D8, you're rolling those two together, but you've got advantage. Well, which one's it on? Do you got to contract? And I just wanted to stay out of that as much as possible. All right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, now, since you brought up damage, let's go, let's go into that. Do you consider that to be one of the rare exceptions to the whole, to this, uh, to this whole notion of minimizing math? Well, it absolutely is the exception in that, you know, your damage roll is comprised of whatever the linked statistic is plus the weapon die. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the linked statistic for fight is strength. There's a couple of ways that you can make it dex for light weapons, but primarily it's strength. So, again, using that example, if you've got a D8 strength Mm -hmm. and a D8 weapon, you're going to roll those two dice together. Both of them can max, and you're adding those numbers together. So there's certainly math involved there. But to, you know, the reward to that is if your dice are maxing, you know, you're getting a really high number on your damage roll. So everybody's usually fairly enthusiastic about that. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, as I looked at that, compared to a skill check, there was just – I couldn't honestly think of any other way – to make it work right. You know, I could live with having your fight skill, the cost of its improvement be linked back to your strength. So, you know, if you've got a D6 strength, when you try to increase your fight to a D8, it becomes more expensive from a destiny cost perspective. So Mm -hmm. to me, that was satisfying enough to, you know, have your strength contribute to your fight or your dex to your throw or pilot or whatever Mm -hmm. whatever it was. But when it came to clocking somebody in the head with a mace, taking your strength out of it, your strength die out of it, um, and just having it be the weapon die, I, I I couldn't think of any way, any other way to do it than use the two dice. All right, that that was what I that was what I was um was think was thinking regarding it. Um now when it comes to the whole concept of maxing, which for all intents, is what's often known as a exploding die. Um, two, th- two, th- two things that, two things I want to ask. First off, um, I'm now. Um, I get the feeling this was the this was the assumed result, but is it a case where you can continuing ma- you can continually max as long as you keep rolling um, the maximum result? Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, and secondly, I um, has there ever been a concern of swinginess when it comes to the idea of maxing? Meaning, um, where you either dramatically roll, you, different. Yeah, you either roll right. really well or really poorly, but never anywhere in the middle. I don't believe so because um, you know the dice are what they are. Mm-hmm. I think. The uh, which is a very whitewashed answer, and I think that the potential for the max keeps a significant danger element in the game. Obviously, the players love it when they max and cream somebody. Mm-hmm. They like it significantly less when it happens to them. But it also ties back to the fate and destiny system because you do have, and this is a familiar term for other games, the ability to soak if you get hit. So you roll your dice, which you might max to be able to bring that number down. Um, so to me, um, swinginess, yes, probably, but I don't know that I would say that in a negative way. You know, your dice are going to tend to average out the way they average out. You know, if you're rolling 2d8, strength d8, and weapon d8, you know, that's going to be 4.5 per die. You're going to average about nine points of damage. Sometimes it's going to be less, but once one of those dice maxes, Mm -hmm. you know, all bets are off and the numbers can get uh, pretty high. But I found it generally to be a a positive element. Yeah. 
And something something that I couldn't I couldn't help but note is that when it when you talk when you talked about powers is the is the fact that you have a lot a lot more different types of powers than would normally would be expected, especially in a universal style game. Because you have the whole you have the whole list of um, powers, then we have then you have elementalism, sorcery, divinity, and mentalism. When a lot yeah. of, a, a lot of cases people would ju- people would rather just do a big power list and um ha- and as you mentioned before with um the Savage Worlds comparison, just do reskins. And I, you know, specifically didn't want to do that. And it was simply, um, to me, that's a, a sort of potato, potato mm-hmm. scenario. Some people will prefer it one way. Others will prefer it the other. My preference is I wanted, um, even though the adventure system is generic, I wanted it to have some flavor to it. You know, I wanted it to, um, you know, if you started going through those necromantic powers or the conjuration powers for them to feel like they belonged there. So if you created a character who was a conjurer, the powers would make sense in that context. And there are ways when you create your character to, um, it gets a bit more expensive, but to, uh, using sorcery as an example, um, buy powers from different schools of sorcery. That's how you'd build a classic wizard, if you will. So you know you could build a character that was a pure conjurer or a necromancer and just choose from those powers. But also if you wanted to build a more, you know, wizardly character, you can add on other schools so that you can sort of cherry pick through those powers to build out the character that you want to have. All right. Um now, with that with that kind of thing in in mind, was given the uh, given the different um, power subtypes that you have, um, was some was some of that to make sure to make sure that you that somebody could potentially gish a little gish a little bit when it came to power types, i.e., somebody who's a wizard who also who also is very good at reading people's minds, for instance. Well. <clears throat> That's all going to depend upon, uh, and it touches on this in the referee section, on how to sort of build out the world that you want to have. Yeah. Like, what are what are you allowing? Like, for example, uh, I don't allow mentalism in my fantasy game at all, um, mm-hmm. but mentalism is all that there is in uh, the sci-fi game yeah. that I run. So it's a matter of those things that you pick, and it gets very expensive to, even if the referee were to allow that, um, it gets quite expensive if you step out of sort of the main type of magic you started with as a character. Mm -hmm. Uh, From a destiny perspective, a typical advance would cost 10. Normally you have enough each, uh, session or after each session, you've got 10 destiny that you can spend. So typically in the adventure system, the idea behind it is at a normal pace that your character gets to buy one advancement, you know, after each session, just by way of example, um, any of those things, elementalism, sorcery, mentalism are 25 points just to get into that type of magic and you get one really lightweight power. So for example, sorcery, you get the mage site power. Mm-hmm. Then each power you buy costs 10, 15, or 25 destiny based on whether or not it's a minor power, a power, or a major power. Mm-hmm. So while ultimately you could do what you're suggesting, there's an opportunity cost to that from the perspective of building your character. So you'd have to feel mm-hmm. very strongly about it within your character concept. If you were really just um, cherry picking, for lack of a mm-hmm. better word, um, you'd probably end up with a character that didn't work particularly well, only because you would have, you know, offloaded a lot of points to something that didn't really make sense within the concept. Yep. Now, when it comes to now, you'd mentioned earlier about um, fate, about um, fate and destiny, and 
I could easily see fate um, filling the role of an extra effort um, mechanic, but um, what was the reasoning you ha what was the reason you had in mind for the interlinking that fate and destiny have? I thought it was cool. <laughs> um, you know, I think um, it uh, and very oddly, um, the concept of destiny came to me from the Lord of the Rings online role playing game. Mm -hmm. They had this uh, currency and it called destiny that I don't even remember what you did with it. I had a dwarf character in that ages ago. And I just thought ah, destiny It would be cool to have something in the game called destiny. And that's really the adventure system. That's the whole thing of it is over 20 years. I collected all the mechanics or things that I thought was cool and finally boiled it down to stuff that worked together. But ultimately from a fate and de destiny perspective, um, I thought that having essentially one currency that allowed you to alter dice rolls in play. So you have a certain amount of fate that um, you happen to start with in session one but then it gets replenished uh, after each session as your experience. So you never get that initial amount back. You know, you don't just always start at 12 if your number's 12. You have 12 fate in the very first session you play in, then you spend it, and then it gets replenished by what you earn. So it's not automatic, if mm -hmm. you will. And anything over your maximum flows over into destiny. So as a simple example, if you're a guy with 12 fate and you spend five and you're awarded 15 10 flow over into destiny and destiny is what you spend on advancements and it just always really spoke to me having those be one currency because it creates um and i was talking about this with one of uh, the guys who plays in my game the other day some interesting dynamics where uh it's a one way so fate flows to destiny mm -hmm. but destiny can't go back into fate right yeah. But what that means is, say you had 10 Destiny and you wanted to buy something that cost 15. Well, you can poach five of your fate to get your Destiny up to 15, but then you're going to start the next session with seven fate, so you're in the hole, if you will. So you've now got less fate in that session to impact dice rolls and whatnot. And then, of course, that's going to impact how much you're going to have left over Destiny after you get your Fate Award at the end of the session. So I just thought all of that worked well together and um, made for a, a unique is always a strong word, but for a system that's not um, commonly used. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. I, I like to think in this circumstance yeah. that it's good. Now, when it comes to... When it comes to um combat now, obviously, um wounds is going to be the sum of endur of endurance and fortitude. But do you consider the do you consider the combat loop to lean more on the lethal end of things with the adventure system, or do you think or do you think it's a bit more flexible than that? Um, I think fate that we were just talking about mm -hmm. is a great equalizer for players um your typical minion level or the way they're classified in the adventure system minion advanced and elite mm -hmm. opponents don't have any fate of their own uh the referee gets a fate pool equal to two fate points per player i've got three people in my group so i have six uh, the higher level npcs or villains or whatever have a small fate pool so um it's it, it tends to lean towards fairly heroic uh, for the players because mm -hmm. they've got fate to work with to hit instead of missing or to successfully defend instead of filling out. They're not always going to make it, but at least they've got a chance. Um, and, and to soak, as we talked about before, if they were to get hit. Um, so the players have a lot of tools to try and stay out of trouble. Um, but in, uh, you know, the past two or three sessions, um, one of the players, um, you haven't seen my son who lives up in Connecticut, um, was down to one wound by the end of the session. They were taking over this Venusian destroyer. Mm -hmm. And by the time they got into the last fight on the command deck, he had one wound point left. And uh, he actually got creamed in the next session. He was mostly healed. 
And in the next session, he got gutted by this, uh, they were called the empty men of Van they were way out in the outer fringes of the solar system there. Mm-hmm. And they got in a fight in this club and the guy nailed them with a power claw. So ultimately the players are at risk, but they have the chance generally to be fairly heroic because of their fate. The great equalizer to that is, uh, and this is a key rule in the adventure system, is that if you roll a natural one, that's a critical failure. Uh, sometimes the referee there rule the critical failure has other nasty repercussions, but the primary element of it is you can't spend fate to alter the role. So if the dice come up one, you can't spend any fate. So mm-hmm. if that's a defense role or you roll to hit or whatever the case may be, that's where you can get into a bind. All right. Now, when it now um, when it comes to this, when it comes when it comes to um, the early days of advent of adventure system, something I'm curious about was, did you intend for this to be a universal style game from the get go, or were you aiming to shoot for a diff- for a specific genre initially, and it just expanded out from there? So, I wasn't even though that's largely how I used it. What I mean by that is, and this is really the genesis of how it went from, you know, my toy to something that's out there to share with other people. Um, I would always incorporate the rules into the world book of whatever I was running. So if it was fantasy, the rules would be crammed in there Mm -hmm. with all the fantasy bits along with all the world information for that fantasy world. And then when my players and I would decide to switch back to sci-fi or alternate history or something else, I would be like, well, you know, if there wasn't a system out that we wanted to use, um, like we ran Dark Heresy for a while because we were 40K fans, and we just used that as it was. But if there wasn't, I'd be like, well, I'm going to use my system. So I would then have to extract the rules out of the fantasy book, stick them into the sci-fi book, add in the sci-fi bits, and then rinse and repeat when I switched to something else. Because, of course, the most current version of the rules was always in the last thing I ran. So it now no longer matched fantasy even if I went back to it, right? Mm-hmm. So finally, after years of – and that would take a couple of weeks, right? And it was just annoying sort of like turning the game into paperwork. Mm-hmm. Uh, last year in like May, I was like, oh. I've had enough of that. I'm just going to put all the rules in one spot, put the fantasy weapons and the powers and psionics and sci-fi weapons. I'm going to put them all in one spot and then just have the world book be the world. Yeah. And when I finished doing that, I'm, so I'm going to do it once and I'm done and stop doing it. Well, I finished doing it and it was like 110 pages. I was like, holy moly. And I just sort of realized that I actually had something that was close to something useful you know, because it was all really just rules without any writing. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, then four or five months later, once you put in the writing, uh, I had the adventure system. Yeah. Now, I do want to ask something regarding talents. Um, now, obvious, obviously, um, it would be very easy to make, ta- to make comparisons to things like feats, edges, or knacks in um, other games. But... For you, what if somebody was to expand on what um, what the adventure system has for their own table? What would be the line between what would classify as a skill or something else, and what would classify as a talent? Well, that's a good question. Um, a talent generally makes you better at something or allows you to do something you otherwise couldn't do and you know the probably the most low-hanging example of that would be any character can double strike you know Mm -hmm. attack twice with two light weapons under certain circumstances but they have disadvantage on both attacks the ambidextrous talent takes away the disadvantage on your offhand attack and the dual weapon talent takes away disadvantage on the main hand attack so now you're straight up an improved dual weapon, uh, which is a you know step up from the dual weapon talent, very mm-hmm. cleverly named, um, allows you to now use medium weapons to double strike instead of just light weapons. Yeah. So ultimately, talents just improve upon, allow you to do something you otherwise couldn't do or improve upon something that you could normally do 
whereas skills are, you know, fight, dodge, shoot. Yeah. Um, now, with, with that kind of thing in mind, I do want to ask about the compass uh, system. Now, first, I'll get the obvious question out of the way. Was the compass system designed to be your own take on the concept of, al the concept of alignment? Not really, because um, it is represents your character's actual actions in play, mm -hmm. whereas your alignment um, is a guide to how you should play. Um, the compass, so everyone, unless you happen to have a particular background or something that would say otherwise, mm -hmm. starts with a zero morality honor and sanity and then if you perform evil acts good acts honorable acts etc or crazy horrible things happen to you those things can then slide up to a plus one a plus two or a minus one or a minus two and then at four and eight be it plus or minus so you know plus four or minus four mm -hmm. um you begin to see benefits or penalties and when you and how it works is if you get an evil check, you make a roll. And if you succeed on the roll, whether you're wanting to succeed or not, right, um, it pulls your morality in the negative direction. So if you were at a zero, in fact, if you're at a zero, you don't bother to roll. You automatically go to negative one because you couldn't fail the roll. But ultimately, that's what I think is different than alignment that, you know, the dice come into it because it gets harder and harder. The further you get from that center point, the harder it gets for it to go further up. And then there are um, things that you can unlock, a uh, large one of which, for example, is the might talent, uh, which you can't unlock till you are honorable, which is a plus eight honor, which is pretty difficult actually to get to. And what might allows you to do is to spend fate on damage rolls, which normally you can't do. So there's a few things that are excluded from fate rolls. Mm -hmm. So it takes your character and, well, makes you mighty, right? It, now you can spend fate on a damage roll and jack up a damage roll whenever you need to at the cost of the fate, of course. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it's, uh, you know, ultimately in the end, can it kind of look like what your alignment looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my son in Connecticut, who I mentioned before, his last character in the fantasy game that I run called Iron Lands, uh, was pretty much a paladin. And he ultimately did get to a plus eight honor. And I forget what his morality was, but, you know, it was like a plus six or something like that. So does that translate into mm -hmm. lawful good? Yeah, more or less. But you get there in a very, very different way. Now... When it comes now, um, something I something I will admit I got a kick I got a kick out of, especially given how character creation is going to work, is the inclusion of archetypes. Um, was that something that was done to make sure that nobody has the choice paralysis problem? You know, um, for a number of reasons, and that's one of them. Um, you know. Skill-based systems, which is what the adventure system more savage worlds or almost any generic type of system you're going to play in um, are, you know, skill-based rather than class-based. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some people, you know, are staring at that white piece of paper and they're just not quite sure how they want to put a character together or maybe even what type of character they would want to have. So by putting, uh, there are 12 archetypes in the core rules and in each of the world books that uh, I'm working on, there'll be 12 specific archetypes for that, even more developed than the ones that are in the core rules that are just there to show you one, uh, to just give you characters you could pick from if you wanted to. And I mean, they're all over the place in the archetypes if you're looking at them from, you know, combat mage to cyborg to mm -hmm. uh, necromancer. Yeah, it's necromancer. Look at that. Um, so for you to pick from or something that's close, you can then just kind of work with your referee and swap out some skills and talents to make it into what you want to, or to just show you how to 
build characters that look different Mm -hmm. in a skill-based system, right? Because, you know, they all start out exactly the same. And then based upon how you put together their statistics, skills, and talents is how you end up with a rocket jock and a necromancer being very, very different from each other. So they're just tools for all those things to give somebody something to look at and a place to sort of start from. Yeah. Now, I did find the inclusion of a of a wealth stat to be very interesting because it's not something that I see happen often. In fact, I, in fact, when I think of the last time I saw this majorly so, it was D twenty modern. And while there's probably some others that I'm not think that I'm, that I'm not thinking of, the point is is that it's not done all that often. Um, would it be fair of me to assume that the idea of a wealth system was done as a means to, um, abstract cost? Bill, you there? So there was uh, really one driving reason behind putting a wealth system in play versus what in the adventure system I refer to as hard currency or, Mm -hmm. you know, a silver system in a fantasy game. And that was um, once you get into any modern world, sci-fi, cyberpunk, even, you know, a game set in 2020, modern finances are complicated. And ultimately, uh, from my perspective, kind of boring to deal with in the game. And for example, in the Outland campaign, the science fiction one that I'm getting towards the end of right now, mm-hmm. you know, they ended up owning a spaceship and all that kind of stuff. Dealing with all of that stuff in a hard credits kind of way gets to me to be feeling like being an accountant, which, um, you know, isn't something commonly I would think a lot of people would have be their goal in a role playing game to be an accountant. Um, so ultimately, the wealth system is simply supposed to uh, smooth all that out in a fairly simple way uh, by tracking your wealth and then profit and loss, which are just very small numbers that track up and down and help you determine whether your wealth is going to go up or go down. Mm-hmm. Now, the in- now the other th- the other thing I want the other thing that I want that I wanted to a- I wanted to ask on is when you en- when you ended up going up for a bit of a supers thing with one of the expansions. Um, now when it- now obviously the line between superhero games and universal style games is very very thin, but. How was that something that you had always planned on, but just didn't have room in the core book, or was it a case where it was suggested to you um, later on? You know, I was down, down to the end of the core rules, and I did want to have a number of uh, primers in the back in Adventure System Speak. That's just a two-page starter for someone. The other two in the Adventure System Beyond Supers are World War II mm-hmm. and the Old West. So. The book gives you fantasy weapons and sci-fi weapons, but in the primer, it just, hey, here's some World War II weapons and stuff. So if somebody wanted to run something like that, it would give them a leg up as a place to start for getting sort of their own campaign stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, oh, geez, you know, pe- people had asked, you know, as I was sort of advertising the adventure system, you know, in various different forms and whatnot. The most common question I got was, can you run supers? And I was like, dad. And at first, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't really sure because I'm like, you know, Supers is, is a tough nut to crack to have it work right. And, you know, so my thinking was, well, you know, if you want to run Supers, maybe you're just better off with Mutants and Masterminds or whatever Supers game you like. Mm-hmm. But then I started to think about, well, how could I do it and make it work? And um, ultimately, I thought it could work. And so I built that primer that I added into the back of the core rules. And then more people kept asking about 
supers, uh, including a couple of my players who are into it. So we ended up running a supers campaign that was five or six sessions long. And I had long had a bunch of villains in mind and whatnot. So I just decided to create a character calculator in Excel just to make it a little bit easier because supers are a little more complicated to put together and the calculator's up on the website if anybody wants it. Um, And uh, so that just led me down the road of, you know, um, I've got all the stuff I can put it together into the supers extra to give uh, people even more to work with if that's what they wanted to run. Mm -hmm. And just from a practical perspective, um, I think the supers extra is, you know, 30 pages long or something like that. Yeah. You know, some, a few more rules on how to deal with supers. And then mainly it's a bunch of heroes and villains. Mm-hmm. Um, it was much more manageable to put together and release as a supporting product than, for example, the Outland, which is the science fiction game I've referenced, yeah. uh, which may be done by the end of the year. You know, it's up to about 150 pages or so. But that's a lot of work. You know, it takes a lot of work to put that together, get the art done, get it ready. So supers, people were asking about it. Um, I found it interesting. I had the ideas. And ultimately, it was uh, doable. You know, I probably took uh, four or five weeks once I got going with the artist I primarily worked with uh, to get it knocked out. Yeah. Now, given given the way you described a bit it about it being a um, a popular demand kind of thing, when you were developing the Supers expansion, um, were there were there any th- were there any um, th- were there any um, difficulties that you that you had converting um, adv- converting adventure system over to supers at first? Um, you know, it actually it actually worked pretty well because uh, although I, <laughs> the reason it worked pretty well is I violated my own design concept. Because it was the only way I could think of to do it um, in supers. So as we talked about earlier, you know, you don't have to skin your powers in the adventure system. You know, your necromancy powers are necromancy powers, and they have necromancy power names. So you don't have to take a generic thing and turn it into a specific thing. In supers, you take a specific thing and turn it into another specific thing. Yeah. So essentially, to create your superhero what the rules tell you how to do is how to convert, you know, pick the closest power to what you want to do. So each superpower is custom created effectively, pick the closest power to what you want to do, then work with your referee to finalize what it looks like. So Mm -hmm. instead of taking a generic thing and making it specific, you're taking a specific thing and turning it into another specific thing. Um, And that was, um, you know, it wasn't all that big of a challenge to figure out how to do it, to be honest with you. Because, you know, when you really think about it, even superpowers is complicated as they get. When you look at all the magical powers in there, mm-hmm. you know, there's usually something in the neighborhood. So it's really just sort of thinking about creating the guidelines to allow people to do it in a structured way without it uh, getting too wacky so that it didn't work right yeah now when it came to um when it came to when it came to powers um like he, even with even, um specific specifically the specifically the um core po- the core power of things um I know you mentioned that you wanted to avoid um, going excessively mathy, but were but um, what were what did you speci- what did you specifically want to emphasize and want to avoid compared to other universal games that use powers? We already mentioned the whole thing about um, re- about reskinning, but is there anything else that came to mind that you were kind of responding to? Um. A couple of things. It wasn't per se in response to anything else because, you know, everybody wants different things from different games. You know, Mm -hmm. similarly, all gaming groups, you know, all players don't fit in all game groups and all games don't fit for all players and all that. So um, it uh, was for them to feel 
like they belonged where they were, like a necromancy power was a necromancy power. Mm -hmm. And to not, uh, as much as possible, to not just, and there's not none of this, but to not just reskin a power into a different magical area with a different name, but have it be the same thing. Uh, it was impossible to avoid that entirely, but um, to have each power as much as possible be, you know, unique ish within the system and ultimately to feel like it belonged where it was. And it got to be a challenge. The challenge really probably at the end was trying to fill out each of those different power areas so that they were reasonably balanced, meaning between necromancy and conjuration or elementalism or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And, um, get enough powers in there under those guidelines. And I remember I um, was trying to come up with some more elementalism powers and I literally flipped through my D and D deck of spell cards, right? Just looking, looking for ideas of something to add. Uh, I druidism specifically, cause I was trying to add to elementalism and, and I didn't find anything that sort of met my, criteria and that's not a criticism of the spell cards or druidism it's just the way that it fits together because uh for example some of the powers like it's a power called minor elemental control that allows you to do minor elemental control of say fire if you're a fire mage or water if you're a water mage um and it allows you to do so many different things mm -hmm. that when you compare it again to like very specific Druidism powers in D&D, that knocked out a whole bunch of them. Like an Earth Mage with minor elemental control could do Entangle or um, different things like that. Yep. And with that, kind of thing, with that kind of thing in mind, um, I could easily see the possibility of, cer of certain power types um, overlapping on each other or dipping into or stepping into each other's territory. Um, what were some of the steps you did to make sure that that didn't happen? Um, one that especially comes to mind because I could see this kind of thing happening is, um, is sort is divin is divinity dipping into um dipping into into the more magical approaches. Well, you know, it was unavoidable mm -hmm. there to be honest. So, um, my approach to that was to be shameless about it. So where I could create unique powers in Divinity, for example, I did so. But if, for example, uh, in using the Priests of Evil, one of their minor magical powers is Command Death Spirit, and it just says, you know, commands death spirit the same as a necromancer. So I didn't rewrite it and pretend it was something different. I was just like, hey, you know, you're an evil priest. You can do this one same thing as a necromancer. Mm -hmm. uh, because ultimately, you know, that's where the challenge comes in is, you know, straining your creativity to try and keep coming up with different things. And um, a divinity... You know, I sort of created all, not all, but most of the sorcery powers before I started adding the divinity stuff. So at that point, you know, it, it, it gets pretty challenging to create unique mm -hmm. powers, right? So I just accepted the over, overlap where, where it was going to, where it was going to happen. Yep. Now, with the... With the the other big one that come that comes to mind, and this is something that I've struggled with as well in my own in my own campaigns, is when you have magic users and psychics in the sa in the same kind of setting. And given the fact that you have that you have um, both of those in different chapters, there's the inevitable possibility that somebody might try and do that. Now. Obviously, I can't speak for every table in existence, but... Meaning um, having mentalism or psionics in your, your fantasy game. Yes. And 
what I'm curious of, I'm curious about is how in that in that kind of is episode, that what you're referring to, Mildred? Somebody yeah. having wanting to have mentalism powers in a fantasy game. Yeah, and what I'm what I'm curious about is how is is um how you would rationalize that um hy- that hypothetical of having a place where wizards and psychics are in the same setting. So that's an interesting question. And um, ultimately, I think that it goes back to the concept that we discussed of trying to make the powers seem like they belong where they are. So in this case, mentalism powers feel like mentalism, psionics and whatnot, and not just like reskinned magical powers. And to a large degree, I like to think I succeeded in doing that. Mm. Now, in biomancy, there's a power called bio lightning, so I'm not going to try and convince you that that's much different than lightning you would get as an air mage. But um, other powers certainly feel more like mentalism. So I think that if you combine those two things together, Mm -hmm. um, I think it would work just fine. Um, I don't do it in my fantasy game because I like to keep it pure if you will, but I think all of the different power categories would work fine together if that's what you felt was a good fit for your game. Yeah. And when it now when it come when it comes to the when it, when it comes to the um whole idea of primers, you know, these two these two page um expansions or or settings and like um what was were, were those primers born from how you would set up um, campaign settings with your group? Generally, yes, um, because you know there's a big difference between the amount of work you would do to prep to start a new campaign that you're just running for your friends Mm -hmm. and the type of thing that you prepare as a product, obviously. Yeah. And, you know, looking, looking at any one of those primers, the world war two one, for example, that's literally two rules pages of here's what allowed, what's allowed, like what we just talked about, you know, in your fantasy game, do you allow mentalism? Do you not? And um, here's some world war two weapons, which is what I would have done back in the day if I was going to run a world war two alternate history thing for my friends, I would have done minimum amount of work possible to get the campaign off the ground and then fill it out as it, as it went. Um, So the primers are, are built for exactly that purpose to just give you that starting point, uh, both as an example of how you could create your own, or if you wanted to use what there was. And interesting that there were uh, a couple of people who I've talked to that, uh, specifically picked the adventure system because of the old West primer because mm-hmm. they were really into the whole weird West concept yeah. and because it already had, you know, undead and monsters and stuff like that. And the old West primer was in there. They're like, Hey, I'm good to go. Um, so really that's, that's the purpose just to give you that stepping stone to get a campaign up and running quickly. Um, and some of them like black powder, um, you could add to a fantasy game if you wanted to have, you know, black powder in your fantasy game. Yeah. Um, and when it's fun, it's funny that you mentioned, um, you mentioned you guys playing dark heresy at some point, because when I look at, um, certain aspects with the, within the text, I can definitely see a little bit of the DNA, especially when it comes to weapons. You know, uh, I really like 40K. And, uh, and uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't really have anybody to play actual tabletop 40K with down here. Um, I, tried to, I tried to get my uh, 11-year-old son to play, and he tried, but he, um, he finally told his mom on the side that he thought it was really boring because he was afraid to tell me because the games were too long. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, the... There's just a lot of stuff in there that's really cool, 
And so, you know, if I'm putting together a sci-fi weapons table, man, there's going to be a power fist in there and there's going to be power swords um, because why wouldn't there be? Yeah. It's as simple as that, right? Yeah. The I will admit that the main thing that kind of tipped me off on, on that was how you had listed rate of fire rules. Oh, that's interesting. Um, meaning uh, semi-automatic burst fire, full auto, just those specifically? Yeah. Yeah, the way it, the way it was um, formatted had that had that kind of vibe for me. Interesting, interesting. Um, ultimately, for me, it was more the different weapons, you know, that had maybe a forty k field power sword, power hammer, whatever. Um, when it came to the rates of fire, um, there are some uh, things that I think turned out very positive that maybe initially concerned me with some of the concepts, one of which is even just using polyhedral dice, right? Because you're talking about um, really you've only got five steps there, right? Mm -hmm. D4, D6, D8, D10, D12, you know, yep. it, as compared to having a statistic that goes from one to 20 or something like that. Um, but ultimately, you know, it feels meaningfully different to have a D8 strength versus a D6 strength, strength or mm -hmm. whatever in play. But interestingly, once you get rid of modifiers and such, when you then sit down and think about how to do something like create weapon, you know, how many different weapon traits you're going to have, what do weapons look like, how are you going to use rates of fire, and how are they going to work with the tools you have in your toolkit, which in this case largely is advantage and disadvantage, as the only circumstantial modifiers you have. So you can't be like, oh, well, when it's burst fire, you're a plus two, but when you're a full auto, you're a plus five, you know, because you don't have those tools in your toolkit intentionally. Um, you know, so I find it interesting that you connected those back to a dark heresy sort of vibe. Yeah. And that that's the reason why I use the term DNA with this. It's not, it wasn't anything overt, it was it was just these it was just these little things that uh, made me draw that made me draw that comparison. Um, when it can, now, when it comes to when it comes to um ve when it comes to vehicles, I often see a temptation in universal games to have vehicles be treated as a slightly different version of character creation. Um. What was that? Some, was that something that you had seen and want and wanted to avoid, or how? Or uh, what were some of the th what were some of the design pillars you had when it came to vehicle creation and and vehicle um, combat? Well, so I did want as much as possible throughout the rules and including with vehicles for things to work the same throughout the system, so you weren't. You know, so vehicles worked in a way that was much different than regular combat or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it's like you were learning a separate system, if you will. That's probably an overly dramatic way to say it. But ultimately, I wanted them to work as much the same as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, with vehicles, I didn't want to use the same type of characteristic names, but ultimately... A vehicle's structure and durability are, in essence, the same thing as a character's toughness and wounds, right? They're just named different because it makes more sense for a vehicle. Um, and we added some different advanced actions for vehicles about and how they work in combat. But ultimately, I did want it to work the same. The one thing, uh, stepping right off of what you said, however, that I didn't want to do, and I actually put this in FAQ on the website, is I didn't want to create a vehicle creation system. Yep, you got to have a character creation system because you're building characters. But I didn't want vehicles, again, going back to the accounting thing, yeah. you know, they needed to be fair and make sense. And, and I don't want to stop referees from creating their own vehicles. Um, but, you know, the advice I gave in the FEQ was, well, just pick something close and modify it and make it into what you want. Just be careful not to make stuff that's not balanced, right? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to have a 
vehicle creation system where everything was an accounting mm -hmm. exercise. So to be honest with you, you know, I spitballed all these vehicles, audited them, crunched them around, fixed them uh, till they looked the way that they look now. Yeah. Now, you've already had you've already had a sizable amount of um, expansions when it comes to when it comes to the adventure system. Now I know I know that you had mentioned that there was one that there was a setting book you were you were working on. I believe that was for um, Outland. Um, Correct. What what would you be shooting for as far as a release date for that? Are you thinking like February of twenty twenty one? First quarter, ideally. Um, it's uh, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of it in the state that it's in, uh, so you can take a look at it. Mm -hmm. um, you know the. Um, the world books all follow the same format. Uh, chapters are laid out in the same way, in a very similar way to the uh, core rules. Mm -hmm. um, the first four chapters, which are sort of an overview, characters, any setting specific rules and stuff like that. In the case of Outland, that's um, just some more sci-fi rules and stuff like that. Then a tech section in this case which has uh, some more vehicles, some more weapons and various stuff like that. But then you get into the actual world stuff, chapter five in this case. Um, so the first four are pretty much done and probably a third of the uh, world book section is complete. And there's a lot of content in the others, but they're just not fully written. So I'm hoping to wrap up my part of it uh, by the end of the year, uh, then it's a question of finishing out the art. You know, working with artists is a very, um, it's a pleasure, but it's a very different and interesting part of putting the book together. You, know, you write all the rest of the book yourself. Um, working with the artists is a very different experience, you know, getting what you want and all that. Um, so then it's just a question of filling the book out with the art. Uh, but the beginning section, the character section, uh, is very art heavy. Um, I forget how many races are in there. I should know that. But um, all the art for those, you know, there's a piece for each race. All those are done. Um, then there's a subclass of races called Moreau, which are like these animal men sort of thing. Those are all done. And we're moving on to the arch type section as far as art goes. So ultimately at that point, there's a little less art from a density perspective in the other sections. Uh, so yeah, I'm hoping to have it out in the first quarter. That's a very yeah. long winded first quarter answer. And to make sure we don't end up tempting the gods of irony. Okay, there, there we go. Jinxing averted. I sure hope so. Yeah. But with the... With that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. Um, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Well, Mildred, I very much appreciate the opportunity, mm -hmm. and I appreciate the work that you do to help uh, independent publishers uh, get some exposure because that's certainly a um, challenging part of this you know it's really hard to get the word out about whatever it is that you've created and uh it's really great what you do on that front mm -hmm. i i appreciate that i appreciate that and like like i said anytime you see fit to come back um doors all doors always open as i often i appreciate say, that mm -hmm. as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged that is well said sir and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the insanity. And there's going to be more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming okay. monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>